Jesus' name, Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord, that you're here in our midst. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. We bless you to continue doing whatever you want to. Amen, saints of God. Holy Spirit, have your way in our midst. Bring healing of soul, bring healing of body, bring restoration of spirit, bring renewal to our hearts. Have your perfect way in our midst. We bless, we bless the work of Holy Spirit in our atmosphere. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I can tell you there's times where I come in the door and there's a heaviness on me that I cannot shake. But when I come into the atmosphere of the fellowship of the saints, joy abounds. (laughs) It's part of the Holy Spirit's work. And as much as I don't want to quench the Spirit, I want to invite that joy to continue. There are some things that I would like to share with you today. I feel led by the Spirit to do so. So I'm going to move us on and transition us. First, a recap of our trip. Pastor Sam and I went to Africa, and um, we went to Tanzania, and it was a wonderful trip. There was a depth of connection that we had as brothers that we have not had uh, that I have rarely shared with anyone else, just, just the way that God was moving in our connection and through us. Uh, I, I received a lot from Sam, and I believe I blessed him as well. Um, Sam, if you want to share anything, feel free. I'm gonna <laughs> correct me or add anything that I, I say. This is a picture of what Sam, the builder, Also the pastor, but the builder, says is the best building he's ever seen in Africa. Some of you will recognize this. This is a building that we helped helped build. Um, Some of our congregants, uh, our members, Bruce and uh, uh, Heidi went themselves, but we funded this building. It's a woman's dormitory at the Kilimanjaro Christian College that Dan Larkin founded. And it is a beautiful building. I just wanted to give you a, a, a snapshot of the finished product that we, we produced. This is a picture of the inside. I think your words, Brother Sam, were, <laughs> this is luxury. <laughs> there's dirt roads and there's, there's all kinds of shabby establishments around this place. But this is where... S- The way God is blessing this place, this is one of the offshoots of his blessing. This next picture is a picture of the church in another part of Tanzania where we spent the majority of our time, Bubadi. Um, This is the church where we instructed about 18 pastors, uh, female and male pastors, um, who are just hungry for the Lord and have a heart for Tanzania and their community. I'll mention that Bubadi is a place that um, many of the Tanzanians look down on. (laughs) It's like a no one wants to go there. No one wants to do anything there. But this church has helped the work of the Lord prosper in this place, and it's growing faster than most places in Tanzania. The work of the Lord is, is prospering there. The buildings are going up faster. People are being touched. The spiritual atmosphere is being changed. <clears throat> Sam and I would teach uh, first a two-hour session. We would alternate sessions. First a two-hour session, then an hour-and-a-half session, and then an hour session. And that was good to design it like that because as the sessions go on, you tend to see a little bit more sleepiness in the students. Our church was able to buy them through our missions group here, our missions ministry here, buy them a motorcycle, which is necessary for uh, the leadership of, of PEFA, uh, P- Pentecostal Evangelical Fellowship of Africa, in this particular, uh, in Tanzania. He's, uh, Eli Rehema is his name. He is over a thousand different churches. And so you can imagine there's travel that has to take place. And the cost of diesel there exceeds our own cost of diesel. And their their, uh, salaries are much, much lower. So uh, we've got them this motorcycle to help them out. This is a picture of Sam and Ella Rehema. And uh, 
I don't know if he's the most, but he's one of the most. He may be the most humble man that I've ever met, Ella Rehema. Just a sweet, sweet spirit. And God is pouring out his grace on a humble heart. And through a humble heart, many people are being touched. Um, we are seriously considering having him come speak in May. And uh, I look forward to that. We're going to talk it over as an elder team. But I, I look forward to any impartation we can receive from this man of God. I know I received some when I was there. At the close of our uh, teachings there, they gave us a send-off prayer. And I just, I just want you to hear the, the spirit of God in this. That, that was such a powerful prayer that I didn't understand a lick of in the language. But as Sam said, we were thoroughly blessed with the life of God in that prayer. Sometimes you don't have to understand what's being said. Sometimes it's better if we don't because our own language limits what we can conceptualize. It's a good thing to pray in the spirit, in tongues, because it's the expression of the Holy Spirit. It's the expression of heaven that comes forth. That was a particular tongue that I have not the gift to interpret, but it was a lot of life in that prayer. And I'll say this as an exhortation for this church. Oftentimes when I get imparted to, when there's a transfer of anointing from one vessel to me, uh, a, a, a minister of the Lord to myself, it takes some time for the reality or the fullness of the manifestation of that impartation to come forth. I've, I've been imparted to, and it's, it's taken as long as six months afterward, and what the Lord had done, what the Holy Spirit had done through that impartation, six months later, it came to fruition. Don't be discouraged if, if you've received a, a laying out of hands and some kind of impartation from anyone in this house and you didn't feel anything at first. The Lord is very, very patient. His timing is impeccable. And when it's time, that gift, that impartation will come forth in full. I want to bless the house with that. We were teaching through the book of Hebrews. And if, we're, if I were to sum up the book of Hebrews in three words, it would be Jesus is superior. Period. We don't know who the writer of Hebrews is, but we do know why he's writing. Repeatedly, he warns this group of Jewish believers to not fall away, not drift away, not become apostate, not turn away from believing in Jesus. These are a group of believers that have been through a lot. The time frame of this writing of the book of Hebrews coincides with a famine throughout the world. We read in the book of Hebrews that their goods have been plundered. That ought to hit home for some of us Americans. <laughs> we like our stuff, which isn't bad in and of itself, as long as the stuff doesn't own us. But you can tell it owns you when some of our goods, some of our stuff gets touched on. You have no right to touch my property. You have no right to my money. Thief! The government is full of thieves. These things that we sometimes talk about. There's a lot we can relate to in the Hebrew people and the Jewish believers. These are people that are struggling in reality, and they're tempted to go back to their old covenant, the old pattern of doing things. Each of us has a default setting. It's like a computer program. When the stress hits, when problems start coming, when the difficulties come, we can, we can revert back to our default programming, just like a computer. But when we're made new in Jesus, superior to any other earthly thing that we're going through, when we're made new in Christ, the default program is reset. Now everything is of him. There's still parts of me that are being made new. There's, there's still parts that are being made into and conformed into his image. I'm being transformed. 
And those parts, those parts still have to catch up with the newness that Christ created in, in me when I first believed in him. But the default program is reset. That's what the author of Hebrews is saying. Because Jesus is superior, your new program, your new heart, can take, you, can ba- you can bear through anything that, that comes your way. The book of Hebrews builds... Chapters 1 through 9, it's a building case of the superiority of Jesus and the centrality of Jesus to everything. I would argue that it reaches its climax, the authorship of Hebrews reaching its climax in chapter 10. In particular, verses 12 and 13. It's referring to Jesus. After he had offered one sacrifice... For sins forever, say forever, Forever. and ever. ever. Nothing is superior to that offering. He sat down. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. He sits down because it's complete. There's nothing lacking. He sat down at the right hand of God from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. That verse 13 is very interesting to me. Because if it's the finished work of Christ, what is he waiting for? He's waiting for his enemies to be made his footstool. The word wait and the word made come from these two Greek words. You can pronounce them if you like. <clears throat> the first one means it's, so much cannot be captured in the English language. That's why it's important sometimes to look and drill down into what it, the original language means. That first word wait is actually meaning expecting a future outcome that is hoped for. It's not just waiting patiently for no outcome just for the sake of long suffering. It's expecting something good to come. This Hebrews is saying Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God expecting a good outcome. That second word, made, more specifically refers to putting into custody putting into custody, putting something in its proper place. And we read in verse 13 of chapter 10, putting it under his footstool. I want to remind us of the words of Jesus to Peter. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. A couple chapters later, he's talking to all of his disciples. Verse 18 of chapter 18 of Matthew. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. There's something very obvious about these two verses that are repeated, meaning Jesus is trying to emphasize and make something clear. There's something very obvious that I have not gotten until going through the book of Hebrews. Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. I'll just say it. What happens here on earth precipitates what happens in heaven. Notice the sequence. Whatever we bind on earth is then bound in heaven. Whatever we loose on earth is then loosed in heaven. What could Jesus possibly be waiting for? For the fullness of his enemy being put under his footstool. He's waiting for us, his church, to step in to the true identity of his pure and spotless bride in spotless unity, in pure belief in him, stepping into our God-given authority that he ordained even with the first Adam, was lost with transgression and is reinstated with the second Adam, Jesus Christ. 
in the context of these verses, Jesus is saying, raise the dead. Heal the sick. Set free from demons. But there's something that often gets in my way. I don't know about you. I have a sneaky suspicion that it might get in your way too. Fear sometimes creeps in. Fear, or the Greek word phobos, means to be terrified, to be afraid, to tremble. Something causes me to falter at times. It can be many things. On this trip, I had a particular fear that I had to deal with. In my times of praying in the Lord and connecting with Holy Spirit, most of that, just, just so you know, most of that involves me just being quiet and letting my ears open up and listening. He knows every word on my mouth before I speak it anyways. But I heard this question from the Holy Spirit, do you trust me? And I instantly knew that it was a holy challenge. And I said, yes, Holy Spirit, I trust you. And he said, do you trust me with your health? I said, you know I do. I walk in faith in that. Will you trust me not to take any medication on this trip? He was drilling down and refining my faith. <clears throat> and I'm not projecting this on anybody. The Spirit speaks to us individually. And each of us have individual measures of faith. Romans 12 tells us that. There's some things that you have faith in that I need your faith in. There's some things that I have faith in that I can bless you with. This was a particular challenge the Holy Spirit was giving me to help me grow in the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And so I didn't take any medication. And I began to be afraid of getting malaria because it's the wet season. <laughs> That's where mosquitoes come out, where all the water's starting to pour down. And that creates a haven for mosquitoes. But I was doing all right. I was holding my own until the second to the last night there. <clears throat> I found this mosquito bite on my forearm. And I, it itched. <laughs> it was red. And instantly fear came in. Not because that's what Jesus wanted. Just because it was a blind spot. And before I knew this is what the Holy Spirit was trying to get me to learn, <laughs> I gave in to fear. And, and I, I was, oh no, I've got malaria now. I didn't know if I had malaria, but I'm th all these things are running through my mind. Oh, the second to the last night, really, God, I accepted the challenge. <laughs> and this is what's happening. <laughs> and once I started, stopped bloviating, <laughs> He, he, he just says, do you believe in my authority? Yes. Break the curse. I didn't know what curse I was breaking. But I just declared it. Not loud. It was in the middle of the night. I didn't want to wake Sam up. <clears throat> but just quietly, in the name of Jesus, in the authority and the power, that's what I said, in the authority and the power of Jesus, I break any curse that's been spoken over me. I woke up three and a half hours later, and I looked at my forearm, and the thing was gone. <laughs> like, completely gone. I'm like, I must have the wrong arm. Mosquito bites last at least three days for me. I looked at the other arm, and it was gone. It was completely gone. The Holy Spirit was gracing me with the capacity to bind something here on earth and therefore bind it in heaven. The binding on earth that we have, that's our commission. It's our God-given destiny. It's who he created us to be. He created us to have dominion and subdue this earth. We gave some of that authority, a lot of it, away to the enemy. But Jesus won it back. He got the keys. And he says, in his last words before his ascension, he says, all authority has been given to me. He says, therefore, go, make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. In other words, walk in the capacity of the authority that our Savior did. 
That's what he's calling us to do. Fear is bad. (laughs) Because we get all gung-ho in our authority, and then that one blind spot, all of a sudden fear trickles in. Paul reminds us that it's a spirit. He says, but you, verse 15 of Romans 8, but you did not receive the spirit of fear, the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of Jesus by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. If you take note of that verse, it's talking about about a bondage of fear. There's an authority that seeks to have us. And sometimes it shows itself in the spirit of fear. It's all of the enemy, whatever spirit it is, it wants to have us. It wants to own us. When we're owned by a spirit of fear, when we're entering into that, when we're partnering with that or any other spirit, we're conceding our authority. But Jesus calls us to step into authority. I shot this next video of a little boy dancing And I put it here in this message because this is how I felt when I exercised the authority of Jesus and powerful things happened. (laughs) That kid was three years old. He's cuter than cute. And he's got rhythm. I can't dance like that, but that's how I felt in the spirit when the authority of Jesus was exercised through me. It was awesome. It's like a childlike faith. Let me show you a couple more verses, then we'll close out. In Luke chapter 9, Jesus gives authority to the disciples, 12 of them, his 12, his inner circle. He gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases and to raise the dead. In chapter 10, he does the same thing with 70 or 72, depending on which count you have in interpretation. It doesn't matter. There was a bunch of disciples. Behold, I give you the authority over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Oftentimes, I'm praying for people at the altar, and the gift of healing flows through me. I'm not the only one in this house with the gift of healing. Pain goes away. A a marvelous miracle of a heaviness through the back can go away. I've seen heart conditions healed. Many things. And don't misunderstand me. I haven't yet gotten to the point where I'm 100% like Jesus. But I'm getting better. And I hope you are too in your respective giftings. But what I've noticed sometimes is when I pray for somebody, they're coming into and they're yielding to the authority that they recognize that I have in Jesus. And so they're in agreement with the authority that I'm exercising. But a week or two weeks later, after they walk out the door, the symptoms start to come back. And it's because they're not exercising their own authority. The book of Ephesians reminds us again that we have authority over the authorities of the enemy. It says, Jesus, remember he's superior to all things. He is above all principality and power. That word power is actually more often translated authority. It's the Greek word exousia. Pastor Paul interprets that word as exercising authority, not just knowing I have it, but actively using it exercising it, and I believe he's correct. The enemy is exercising authority against us. Every might and dominion, he's above it all, and has put all things under his feet and given him to be head over all things to the church. Who is Jesus in regards to the church? He's the head. Say it aloud. He's the head of this church and every church that truly lifts up his name. He is the head. Who is the feet of Jesus? It's us. 
Each member of the body has a particular place, if you will, on the foot. If we are the feet of Christ. I don't know if you've ever had a bunion. Don't raise your hand if you have. <coughs> if you've ever had anything, a ward or anything on your foot, it hurts. There's a way that he wants each of us individually to exercise our, our authority and each of us collectively joining together to exercise our authority together. There's some devils and demons, there's some authorities that influence us individually that we're called to take over and we're called in the name of Jesus to cast down. But there's sometimes that where we come together in our respective authorities and we see amazing thing happen. Gift of intercession, gift of prophecy, gift of healing, gift of faith, gift of wisdom, gift of word of knowledge, and probably some more were used last year as this body joined together. And we agreed for a woman named Cheryl who was in the hospital two weeks brain dead. Jody and her family asked us to pray. We did. Gift of intercession. After operating in the respective sphere of influence, gift of healing, those of us that have that capacity, faith, prophecy, etc., all coming together to believe for Cheryl. The doctor, the night, the night that they had just called the family in for the next morning to say, we've got to stop this machine. It's been too long. The doctor has a dream that night. See Cheryl wake up, her eyes open, sitting up in bed, <clears throat> she calls the nurse at midnight, the doctor, the female doctor, calls the nurse at midnight and says, check on this patient, and she's alert and awake. <clears throat> the family does not know this. <laughs> they go in the next morning, and they meet two doctors, some of the team, as far as I understand, and the doctors are just pleasantly surprised. They're, the family's excited to see Cheryl. The doctors are testing. There's no way. We've never seen anything like this in our medical careers. This can only be explained by God. Amen. That is exercising authority as individuals and as a unit, as a united community. It's a big deal. It's in fact what Jesus has called us to do. It's what he's waiting for us to do to put the enemy under his footstool. Who's on top of his footstool? His feet. Who's his feet? We are. Yes. I'm going to have you stand and we're going to take communion. But I want to leave you with this one, one exhortation. We don't have communion? I thought we did. Deanna, do we have communion? Never mind. We don't have to do it. Don't worry about it. I was just doing it because I was told to. I thought and I misunderstood. That's what happens when you don't listen to the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Help me, Lord, more and more. <clears throat> so I'll close with this exhortation as you lift, stand to your feet. When Jesus was tempted by the enemy, it was the enemy trying to take authority over Jesus. The synoptic gospels tell us that he was tempted three ways. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. He's tempted, and how does he answer? He quotes Deuteronomy. He quotes the word of God. It's living and powerful. We need to keep that in mind when we're exercising authority. We don't exceed the word of God, but we live in the word of God, and we don't quench it. We thrive in it. He quotes the word of God, and in Luke chapter 4 in particular, it says the enemy... Satan himself leaves Jesus for an opportune time. I believe he had several opportune times to try to afflict and try to bring Jesus under his authority, under his subjection, subjugation. Probably one of the most intense times was the night he was betrayed. He's sweating blood. And he says, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. I believe one of the things he was dealing with was fear of being forsaken by the Father. 
Some people teach that the enemy did not know that Jesus would win the battle through death. I don't believe it's so. It's not compatible in my understanding of Scripture. It's not compatible with Satan also understanding that Jesus perfectly overcame temptation. Again and again and again, he lived a perfect life. What is compatible with Scripture and what's universally believed is that devil, the devil slammed everything he could against Jesus. I believe it was because Jesus was about to take the keys of authority from Satan. Jesus won. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, we need to keep this in mind. When we start stepping into the authority and the power that Jesus has destined, has purchased for us, has destined for us to operate in, we are going to meet up against some major resistance because the enemy does not want to yield his territory. He will come at us every which way and sideways. Fears that we've never encountered before. We're not to be afraid of those. Challenges, physical infirmities, spirits of all manner, evil. But we are called to look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, and follow in his stead. Follow in his example. We are his feet. Let's do it. Let's stand, therefore, taking on the whole armor of God. I bless this house in the name of Jesus to have the whole armor of God, not just part of it, the whole armor of God, for us to be pure and being made pure, refined as we put on the belt of truth. Your word is truth. We stand in the living word of God, the breastplate of righteousness. We declare, Jesus, you are our righteousness. The helmet of salvation, or as Paul says, the hope of salvation, which always stands as a barrier between us and, the, and what the enemy foists on us. Lord, we thank you for the shield of faith that completely, by the blood of Jesus, completely protects us from the enemy. However big that mountain may loom, however big the attack may feel, the shield of faith quenches the darts of the fire, the fire darts of the enemy. And Lord, we are not just to be defensive. You give us a sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, to thrust into the enemy and take back that which he has stolen. I speak the taking back and the crushing of the enemy to our individual households in the name of Jesus, individual families, breaking generational curses, reinstating the generational blessing that was intended from the beginning. And I speak a declaration for this house to join like we've never joined before and, to, and collectively putting the devil under our feet to seeing cancer, divorce, suicide, addiction, and all manner of evil become a reality under your feet, become a reality put under the feet of the footstool of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Praise God. As we, as we close in worship, I just want to invite you to come. I gave an exhortation last night about working and laboring in the kingdom. It's a good thing to labor. It's a good thing to Sabbath. We need, we need to do both. But today in the spirit, I feel like there's just an ease, a, a palpable ease. And, and if maybe it's in your chair, maybe it's just standing, maybe it's coming forward. But just breathe in the spirit of God. There's nothing you can do to earn, it, earn the authority of Jesus. It's, it's, it's already there. It's already there. Just be, just be in his presence and let his pneuma, his breath, flow into your spiritual lungs. In Jesus' name, come forward if you'd like to, us to agree with you in that.